presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I firmly believe that this was an, an unnecessary war, not merely in hindsight, but in the context of its own time. And that's what, for me as a historian, is especially important. Coming up on Dialogue, I talk with historian Frederick Logoval. Logoval won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, Embers of War, which looks at how and why America became embroiled in Vietnam. That's Dialogue next. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Marcia Franklin at the Idaho State Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Idaho Falls, where the names of the 251 Idahoans who lost their lives in the war are inscribed. Memorials like this one, as well as films and books, ensure that we won't forget the war in which 58,000 Americans were killed. But how many of us know how our country originally became involved in Vietnam? That's the research passion of my guest today. Frederick Logoval is a professor of history at Harvard University. He spent 11 years working on the book Embers of War, an in-depth look at how the United States became involved in Vietnam back when France was in control of the country. For his efforts, he won the Pulitzer Prize in History. Logoval was the 2016 Distinguished Speaker at the Idaho Humanities Council dinner in Idaho Falls. Before the event, I sat down with him to learn more about this chapter of history and why it still matters. This was an 11 year labor of love. First of all, let's talk about what drove you to spend, at least off and on, 11 years of your life writing this book. What compelled you? Well, I should say, I did not anticipate that it would be an 11 year project. That's the first thing I should say. I anticipated maybe that it would be five to six. In fact, I remember writing in the contract of the book with, with my agent that we would deliver a finished manuscript, and I think it was six years, but more research to do, and there were various complications. But I think what drove me to write the book was a, a continuing interest in the war. I had written my first book, which started life as a PhD dissertation, was on the Vietnam War. I thought that would be a one-off, you know, I'll do that and then move on to something else. But something I think happens to many of us who write about the Vietnam War, where we think, there's just so much more that I want to know. And in this case, a growing fascination with the early period when the French are there and then the early American involvement and wanting to really understand that phase of the war, which I, I had taught my students that period. I knew something about it, but I said, I've got to learn more about this. And that's how the book you know, came to life. What is it about the war that draws you in, that keeps you wanting to learn more and fascinating you? It's a recognition that the Vietnam experience for the United States was of singular importance, certainly in the modern history of the country, with tremendous influence on U.S. foreign policy, on domestic politics, some of which I think we're still feeling the after effects of today. And because, I guess this is the final reason, because archival, you know, I'm a historian and we work with archives, and because there are continual declassifications and new stuff becomes available, uh, we want to we want to get in there and we want to learn what the, what what this material reveals. Talk about what became available, what opened up that was so intriguing to you, mm -hmm. that was new. So what I learned, which I hadn't known before was intelligence documentation pertaining to, uh, and this is even before the CIA exists, so for example, in, the, in World War II, in the summer of 1945, the involvement by the OSS, the forerunner to the CIA, in working with, believe it or not, Ho Chi Minh and his Viet Minh organization against the Japanese, that is an example of something that was new. Some of it was actually, I think, available as I was starting my research, but I hadn't made use of it. But there's also um, great information to be found in French archives, 
in uh, British archives, in Canadian archives, in other countries that were involved in some way with that French war. The one negative, if you will, is that we still don't have the kind of access to Vietnamese materials that I had wanted to see and that all of us who work on the war had wanted to see. There isn't enough. Why did you feel it was so imperative for people to learn about this mm -hmm. pre-history, which really is, I mean, we think of the mm -hmm. beginning of the Vietnam War as, say, when ground troops landed in That's 65. Right. Totally, yeah. But you're, you know, as you, it goes back to you know, yeah. 45 mm -hmm. and before. Yeah. Why was it so important, well, did you think, for the world to know about this prehistory that isn't yeah. really prehistory, it's really the beginning? Well, well, I like the way you put that. I think you're totally right that we in, in, the, in this country, and I'm guilty of this myself, we tend to think of the war as beginning on one spring day in 1965 or, or whatever. Or maybe we will go back to Kennedy into the early 60s, but we won't go much farther back. I felt on the basis of my, my teaching, my reading in the secondary literature, and even some of my other research, that no, if we really want to understand that later American war, we've got to go back because so much of what the French experienced, the Americans would, would experience after them. It also was clear to me that World War II, that is to say even before the so-called French Indochina War, World War II mattered in ways that I didn't quite know when I started, but that I certainly determined. And I do think, to, to, to give you my kind of fundamental point, that World War II is crucial everything that will happen later in Vietnam, including for the Americans. Likewise, that French-Indochina war, pitting French authorities against Ho Chi Minh and his revolutionaries, is also crucial to everything that the Americans will have after. What was really interesting to me, when you look at the end of the World War II, and Franklin Roosevelt was still, well, let's just say, not the very end, but when he was alive, yeah. he was for nationalist movements, yeah. he was for busting up the old colonial regimes, including the French right. colonial regime. And then, of course, he, he, he died and yeah. Truman took over. And um, you, you uh, really, you say in the book, the decision by the Truman administration to support Vietnamese independence in 1945 would have gone a long way toward averting the mass bloodshed and destruction that was to follow. Yeah. In other words, Truman started su you know, yeah. supporting their French in tamping down this nationalist movement. You, do you see that as a real turning potential point where we could have recused ourselves? I think so. I mean, look, Roosevelt, I believe, and not all historians agree with me, Roosevelt went to his grave feeling that the age of colonialism was over, that the United States needed to be on the right side of history, that the French had been especially bad in his judgment as colonizers, and that in fact, if not right away, in a short period of time, Vietnam needed to have full independence. So yes, I think that that transition between Roosevelt and Truman mattered a lot. Truman didn't care as much about this as, as his predecessor did. He had bigger things to worry about. He was concerned, obviously, about reconstruction in Europe. Uh, he had to worry about Japan. So in, uh, in a sense, I won't say he supported the French colonial effort, uh, but he looked implicitly, the other, he looked yeah, the other way. implicitly he did, and I think it had very important consequences. So we call these things counterfactuals, counterfactuals. right? Counterfactuals. So if Roosevelt had lived? Yeah. I think if Roosevelt had lived, there's a very good argument to be made. How about that? Um, that he would have worked to prevent a French return to Indochina. Because let's remember, the Japanese had de facto control during World War II. So it's now about the French trying to get back in, if you will. He would have worked, a surviving FDR, would have worked to prevent a French return and very likely would have succeeded. That's what I would say about that particular counterfactual. And therefore, there wouldn't have been this huge nationalist movement. Uh, no, and, no and because, because Ho Chi Minh had indicated a willingness to work uh, in, in, in a certain way with the French. You would not have required a complete 
overnight withdrawal of all French influence from Indochina, but you could have avoided what became a large-scale war between the two, which was waged for seven bloody years, and which really kind of laid the ground for the American war that followed. Let's talk about Ho Chi Minh, because I really found this part fascinating. Uh, he, he looked towards America. Yeah. He looked towards France. Yeah. He liked the idea of liberty, fraternity, egalite. Yeah. Um, he was kind of this interesting breed of Francophile anti-colonialist. <laughs> yeah, no, he really was. And folks who met with him, including nominally his enemies, liked yeah. the guy. Yeah. Even, didn't yeah. he have the moniker of something like OSS agent number 19? He certainly did. And, and, and so, you know, here was a guy who seemed to want to negotiate and say, guys, yeah. you're normally on the side of freedom. Yeah. Come to my side, yeah. and uh, I promise I won't associate too much with, with the communists, and, and it'll all be good. Yeah. You know, I think he was an extremely charismatic figure. And as you say, even those who were opposed to him found him in one-on-one -on -one discussions like this to be so powerful and so charming and so dynamic. And I do think he was willing to work with the French. I think it's quite clear. I think he looked, this is a particularly fascinating part of the story for me, he always looked to the United States. He visited as, the United States. He visited the United States. Before, uh, before in, in the early part of World War I, he was in the United States. But he thought that the Americans ultimately would be his ally in all of this. That the Americans, because they had been born, their country had been born, born out of an anti-colonial revolution against the British, they would see what he saw. And so you could say he was naive about this. Then I think he decided, no, they're clearly with the French. They're clearly not going to be on my side. We should add, though, with respect to Ho, he was a dedicated communist from an yeah. early point, and he had decided, I think, even in the late mid to late twenties, uh, if not before, that Marxism-Leninism was the best best path of, of development for his country. Um, he was also capable of ruthlessness. You know, I don't want to romanticize uh, Ho unduly, but a powerful figure, who many in the OSS wanted to work with in 1945, and who I think the French could have worked with had they, had they chosen to do so. Communism was at the fore. The yeah. fear of communi yeah. communism was at the fore. And as I understand from your book, we felt, or many felt, because I know there was dissension, yeah. that we needed to support the French because we were afraid of communism. Yeah, I think that that looms very large. The beginning of the Cold War is really inseparable from what we're describing. And I think the French were quite clever in playing up the communist dimension of the struggle and thereby winning American, at least, tacit support and then overt support. Uh, you're right, though, to point out that there was always dissension. There were always Americans who said, now, wait a minute. Uh, communism for Ho Chi Minh is important, but it's not the only thing that's driving this. It's nationalism. So we kept, you know, pumping money into the situation, you know, and... Uh, in 59, we even had advisors oh, in yeah. there. At some point, though, the French were getting just creamed there, yeah. and, and, and yet and still, yep. we were saying, you got to stay in. you yeah. got to keep fighting. Yeah. And I suppose when I read your book, one of the words that came to my mind over and over again was this word hubris. Yeah. You know, just the sense of false pride and arrogance that somehow... Yeah they could defeat this enemy, that somehow yeah. we were going to be different? Yeah, no, I think uh, there's no question that before, this is one of those eureka moments in my research when I realized this. Well before the end of the French War, the Americans were more committed to that French War than were the French themselves. They They're were like, saying, as you... Please, as you, can we get yeah, out of this? Well, and, and as you pointed out, the, the Americans basically said, You've got to keep fighting. Once the military balance is righted, or once the military position is improved, then we can talk about negotiations ne with hope. Negotiate from strength, right? Just negotiate gotta... from strength. Well, there was this idea of the domino theory. Yes. That if we let this happen in Vietnam, it's going to yep. happen in all these other 
yep. countries. That has not proven through research to be the case. No, no. I because think one government changes hands that the ones next door are going to. No, also. no. I think I think I think that's right. I think that it was always a deeply flawed theory. Um, you could kind of see why in that period and before there would be a certain logic to it, that, that, that there was some sense that you know, China has now fallen, quote unquote, uh, and doesn't this mean that all these other countries in that region will also fall? Turned out not to be true. But at least in that early period, I can kind of see why people would want to believe it. By the time we get into the early 60s, and John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, it's very clear, as I think they actually admit when the doors are closed, that this domino theory doesn't really hold much water. Now, Kennedy, you start your book, really, with yeah. Kennedy visiting in, was yeah. it 51? 51. And, he, and he's like, oh my gosh, this is a disaster in the making. And yeah. his brother Bobby felt the same yeah. way. We should not get involved in this. But by the time he was president, would he say, this is our offspring, we can't abandon uh -huh. it. it, abandon it. So it, all along the way, people are, this fear of communism yeah. is keeping us and, and our sunk costs in yeah. the situation, That's right? right. This oh, the sunk costs are really sunk important. Sunk cost fallacy that, yeah. you know, the more money we put into it, oh, we've put so much money into more, it, we can't get out of it. Yeah, and we've got to justify these lives that have been lost. So the French are very guilty of this. This is, again, where we see fascinating parallels between the French experience and the American with respect to the sunk costs. But, but Kennedy is so interesting to me in all of this because, as you say, he goes... In 1951, he's 34 years old. He's going to run for the Senate in Massachusetts the next year. This is a way to boost his credentials. So he goes with his brother Bobby and with Patricia, their sister, and sees the French war up close, writes in his diary, and then gives speeches after he returns to Boston that are nothing if not prescient, in which he says, the French can't win. They're, they're combating a nationalism that is stronger than any military force. By extension, and I'm paraphrasing, by extension, we can't win. So there is this kind of haunting message that this young John F. Kennedy gives. But then, as you say, a, a decade later, when he becomes president, facing pressures that presidents have, by the way, I don't think his skepticism ever really goes away, but he now faces new pressures, as you say, and we see an important escalation of that U.S. involvement under Kennedy that then, of course, also makes it much harder for his successor, LBJ, to know what to do. To get out because get more out. costs have been sunk. Yes. Yeah. So when you're going along and you're researching all this and you see all these pivot points, yeah. these, these areas where we could have extricated ourselves, yeah. was there a sense of frustration as you... Read more yeah, and more, there was. Or? I think there was a sense of frustration, but I'm also trying, as a historian, to be mindful of the fallacy of hindsight, mm -hmm. because it's very easy for us sitting here today to talk about, oh, it was so clear. We should have seen this. We should have done that. What were they thinking? Uh, and I have to remind myself, and I do, that for them, the future is merely a set of options. And they have a lot of things to think about, starting with FDR and then moving all the way through. That said, I want to underscore one point all the way along. There are voices in the American government who say, including John F. Kennedy when he's traveling there in 1951, do we really want to be doing this? Do we really think we can defeat Vietnamese nationalism on its own turf this far away from American shores? So that tells me that there are opportunities. One can speak of missed chances that were not taken. So why did we not learn from the French? I think part of it comes back to hubris, that word that you used before. Ah, the French, what do we have to learn from them? Look at their miserable experience, performance in World War II against the Germans, falling in six weeks, even though they had larger, uh, larger military forces. Look at what they did in so many different places. Most of all, look at their terrible performance in Indochina itself. Therefore, we don't have uh, very much to learn from them. And therefore, now that they're telling us, because the French did this, now that the French are saying to us, learn from us. <laughs> yeah. We don't have to listen to them because for one, for one thing, 
They're, they have schadenfreude. They want us to, to you know, they, they want don't us want to us to, fail. they want us to fail. They don't want us to succeed where we failed. So it's partly that, and I think maybe more importantly, we, the United States, are giving something for the Vietnamese to really fight for, because we're not colonialists. We're the good guys here. We're so we are fighting to defend the, the Vietnamese in their hour of need against the forces of communism. The French were there to uphold a, an imperial enterprise. So that's why we don't have to listen to them. And I want to be, I want to be clear. There were South Vietnamese, many of them, who were courageous, who were diligent, who fought really bravely uh, to try to defeat the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese with American assistance. But there were not enough of them. That was the, that was the fundamental problem. And unless you had, from an American perspective, unless you have a, a strong local force and a government, a local government, with broad popular backing, you're just not going to win in the long term. The French didn't have it with their kind of puppet government, if you want to call it that, and the Americans never had it adequately either. And I, and I thought it was interesting, finally, when the, when the French were wanting to get out, they looked at what we did in Korea and said, yeah. hey, yeah. You, you, oh, yeah. you partitioned Korea. Yeah. Why wouldn't you just let us yeah. do that here? Why do we have to keep fighting on your behalf? Why can't you? And ultimately, that's what happened. Well, and this is another, right. another totally fascinating part of the research for me when I saw this, when I saw that the French were basically saying exactly that. Look, you're negotiating with communists in Korea, both, both, both Korean communists and Chinese communists, with, with, with the Soviets uh, peripherally involved. Why won't you let us do the same thing? We're just wanting to do the same thing here. Uh, and so they drew a very f a direct link. And for them, the Korean truce signed in 53 was therefore kind of demoralizing because they realized they have this deal, stop the bloodshed, and we're expected to continue. So we had 58,000 Americans up to three million Vietnamese, yeah. over 100,000 people fighting for the French side, yeah. who were killed over a period of several decades in this country. Is it your contention that it could have been avoided had we extricated ourselves from helping the French in their war? Oh, no question. Uh, I firmly believe that this was an, an unnecessary war, not merely in hindsight but in the context of its own time. And that's what, for me as a historian, is especially important. Especially when you consider that at the highest levels of the American government, there were doubts, there were misgivings about whether this thing could be won and whether it was necessary even to try to win. As a historian, you obviously look at the past, mm -hmm. but with lessons for the present mm -hmm. and the future, so yeah. has America, have the presidents since then, the Congresses since then, looked at the lessons learned from Vietnam and mm. thought about getting into other wars? Or was the war in Iraq, for instance, a mm -hmm. repeat in your mind of hubris and saving face and yeah. sunk costs that we saw in Vietnam? It's a really good question. And of course, the, the issue with, with so-called lessons of history is people will draw different lessons and people will interpret things differently and those lessons can even change over time. So an, an easy answer to your question is to say, yes, they've learned lessons. But then we have to, of course, think, which lessons? Um, I think as a broad generalization that I would say that American policymakers post-Vietnam have acted with the Vietnam experience, uh, experience and the defeat in Vietnam in mind. And that in, in, in many different respects, it's had a kind of salutary effect. Uh, I think um, quite recently, I've seen evidence in terms of US foreign policy decisions that not wanting to repeat uh, the, the, the agony of Vietnam has, has played into uh, decision making. I think it's also true that it hasn't been a, a kind of, um, a uh, universal response, if you will, by the United States. And I do think, to use your example, that the Iraq invasion uh, occurred in a context, I sometimes call it a permissive context, 
that is quite similar to the Vietnam case. What I mean is this, that just as Johnson and his advisors made these fateful decisions about Vietnam in a permissive context, meaning that Congress, though privately skeptical, was publicly supportive, the press uh, became, in, a, in effect, a kind of cheerleader for the war, at least in the early going. And the public also supported, obviously, the, the initial U.S. involvement, with not very many questions asked. Most Americans were quite apathetic in 1964 and 65. So there's a permissive context. I think the same thing you could say about Iraq, 2002, 2003. A similar kind of permissive context allows George W. Bush and his advisors to launch an invasion um, and which then results in obviously in an insurgency and we're dealing with the after effects even, even today. The beginning of this book starts with Kennedy. Towards the end of the book, you bring President Kennedy, yes. then President Kennedy back into yeah. this. Your next book is on yeah. President Kennedy. Uh, there's been so much written about yeah. him. What are you hoping to add to that? I, I think what I'm hoping to bring is um, uh, a fresh and authoritative uh, voice. This is a book that's going to be based on, on archival, deep archival research and also on the secondary literature. Um, I want to emphasize a theme in the book will be what we might call Kennedy in the world because it's not just in his presidency when foreign policy obviously is of great importance. But I think it's important for him even as a young man and his inter international experiences are, are very important. And I also think that there have been releases, there have been declassifications uh, over the last decade that some authors have taken advantage of, um, but not some of, the, some of the more, some of the biographical literature hasn't taken advantage of. And I want to use that to tell the story of his life to tell the story of the rise of the United States to superpower status in the middle part of the 20th century, his family relations, his domestic policies, hope to do it all. In six years, 11 years? <laughs> no, no, it will not be, and you heard it here first, it will not be 11 years. Uh, and I'm going to do everything I can to have it much closer to that other figure that you said, maybe even under it, we'll see. Well, I look forward to reading that. I'm sure it'll be as interesting as Embers of War, which I also encourage people well, I, to read. I certainly hope you're right about that. We shall see. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me and, by proxy, our, our viewers. I really appreciate it. Well, you're good to have me. Thank you. You've been listening to Professor Frederick Logoval. He teaches at Harvard University, and his book on the beginnings of the Vietnam War, Embers of War, won the Pulitzer Prize for History in 2013. For more on Frederick Logoval, please check out the Dialogue website. Just go to idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.